uh, I've got to thank Brother Jason for that, uh, <laughs> that passage because that was actually one I didn't have in my notes. Um, but it's very good for, uh, for what I'm preaching on today. Um, so I want to look at something that I feel is pretty important to understand. Um, it applies not only to doctrines, but also our daily lives, how we live. Um, and it's the importance of being founded on the rock of God. So the title of the sermon is called, He Shall Not Be Moved. So I'll get you to turn to Psalm chapter 16. But I'll read to you from Deuteronomy 32 verse 30. It says, How shall one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. So even our enemies know there's something about our rock that's different than all their false gods. You know, our rock, of course, being Christ. Um, he's our foundation and our strength. If we're founded upon the rock of God, um, in his doctrine, we won't be moved. Um, this is talking about being moved by an external force. Um, it's not talking about moving yourself. It's talking about something else moving you, uh, an outside influence. Uh, and that's the purpose of the sermon, is to help you understand why it's important to settle certain doctrines in your heart, that you don't be led away by Jewish fables or doctrines of devils, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. But in Psalm 16, verse 1, it says, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord. My goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. So the Lord delights in those who trust in his word. He says he'll preserve them, and that's something that we can trust in, because we are the saints of God in the earth. So that's a promise for us as well. And David knew that for himself and for the children of Israel. In verse 4 it says, Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another god. Their drink offerings of, the, of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou man maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the right seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. So if we set the Lord and his commandments and instructions before us, and we settle in our hearts, um, then we're not going to end up like those who turn their hearts to other gods. Um, it says we shall not be moved. And we've seen that happen many times in scripture, especially those who ignored the Lord's commandment not to multiply wives. Saw that with David and Solomon and others. But Solomon especially, his wives turned his heart away from the Lord and towards false gods. And of course, he was moved because he hadn't established certain things. And one of them was command of God not to multiply wives. If he had settled in the beginning that he was not going to multiply wives, then this would not have happened. So, you know, he allowed himself to stumble and fall. And if you trust in the Lord and his words, you believe them, then you will not be moved either. So I'll read to you from Psalm chapter 1, and I love Psalm 1. You know, it's a small chapter, but it has many great truths in it. Uh, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And because of that, we read verse 3, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in this season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And it goes on to talk about the ungodly, how that's just not the case with them. How they're actually, you know, like the chaff which the wind bloweth away. But that's not how we should be. And it says, meditating on the law and the commands of God, reading and meditating on the scriptures, that's how you get your feet planted by those rivers of water. By settling your foundation upon the rock of God and not on the sinking sands of men. So you see in verse 3, being planted and established by the rivers of water, and that's also necessary for soul winning, for winning souls to the Lord. If you want to be fruitful, first you've got to have your foundation in the Lord. You've got to be safe first, but you've also got to build upon that foundation. You've got to set your feet and your roots in the foundation that is of Christ. So you've got to hear the word and do the work, which we'll get to shortly. But we all know the Bereans, they had a reputation that after they heard the word, they searched the scriptures daily and they were faithfully reconcile what they'd heard with what the scriptures actually said. 
So I'll, uh, I'll read to you from Acts 17.10. It says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. And again, this is an instruction for us. We should be doing the same thing. We should be reading the scriptures daily to take knowledge of the Lord and to his word, to understand his doctrines and his commandments for us. And if we do that, you know, we will be able to test the word of God, you know, against the preachers that we're hearing, because this is the yardstick. This is what we measure everything by, is what the word says. So we need to measure every preacher and everybody who tries to teach us something against what the Bible says. Because if you do that, you, won't, you will not be moved. You'll actually be established in the foundation of God and established in his word. And these things, it's, you know, men will deceive you, but the King James Bible is infallible. You know, you can always trust it. You can trust what it says. And that's why it's our measuring stick. That's why everything gets compared to it. So I'll get you to turn to Psalm 112. And I'll just read to you from Proverbs 12:3. In Proverbs 12, 3, it says, A man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. So we need to be rooted and grounded in Christ. You know, and us, we are righteous because we are the righteousness of Christ. So again, that's our foundation. That's where we need to be found, is having our faith in Christ, having our feet firmly planted on, the, on Christ, on his foundation. And it says we need, uh, the righteous shall not be moved. And it won't, it's not, we won't be moved due to fear. We won't be moved due to false doctrine. These are the external forces that are going to come against you, is fear, you know, whether it be anything you're fearful of, but certainly a fear of persecution, fear of tribulation, um, you know, fear of preaching the word of God because of those things. Um, but you're not going to fear those things. You know, you're not going to have false doctrine come against you. You're not going to be afraid of that either. Those things are not going to shift you off, off the foundation that you have. Even in, uh, it says, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. So again, righteous men are, are men who win souls, and to do that, you have to be established in the Lord, and have, him, have the Lord only as your foundation. And that's where it comes back to as well. The Lord only should you fear. You know, you shouldn't be afraid of other things and let fear actually dictate and pull you away from the truth. But people who are soul winners, they have their feet planted by the, river, by the living waters, by those rivers of water. Um, and I can tell you, and I think most men here will attest to that as well, when you go out soul winning, it actually helps to affirm a lot of what you believe. Because you have to then dig up and explain to people what you believe, and it just helps affirm it in yourself. That's how you get your foundation so rock solid. But you should be there in Psalm 112, verse 1. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion. Compassion and affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be, sorry, unrighteous. A good man showeth favour and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. And this is, this is the part I like. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees desire upon his enemies. So if you want to turn to Psalm chapter 21... But that's the thing, how can we be confident and fearless? And I'll tell you why, it's because we have the Lord on our side. You know, if God be for us, who can be against us? You know, the same confidence I have in my salvation is the same confidence that I have in the Lord's protection and preservation. It's the same confidence that I have in his word. You know, why? Because my heart is fixed. My heart is established in the Lord and in his word. And again, David understood this completely. I read to you from John 17:17. 17, 17. It says, "Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. 
And I've settled in my heart that every word of God is true. Every word of God is the truth. And this, again, John 17, 17, explicitly declaring that thy word is truth. Uh, Proverbs 30, 30, verse 5, we know pretty well. Every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So many times we see the Lord's our strength. He's our refuge. He's our God and he's our redeemer. He's our shield and he's our buckler. You know, he is our tower of defense. It says safety is of the Lord. And that's why I don't fear men. And I previously, the sermon I preached was about the right types of fear because it's important to know why we fear God and why we don't fear men. And if you're established on the foundation of God, then you're not going to fear men. You're not going to fear their doctrines. You're not going to fear their persecution or tribulation. You're going to fear God and him alone. And if, if you fear only God, you will be rooted in him through faith. He is your tower of defense. He's the one you can run to. He's the one who will protect you. He said he'll promise he'll preserve us. You know, we just need to hold him accountable for the promises he made and God will come through on every single one of them because he promised. And that's something that we can rely on. And David certainly understood that. And we'll read from Psalm 62 verse 2 that we read from earlier. It says, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. So you're there in Psalm 21 verse 1. It says, The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. Like, when's the last time you rejoiced in the Lord's strength? When's the last time that you were feeling down or you are feeling like you were persecuted and maybe needed some help? Like, who did you run to? Did you run to the Lord or did you run to man? Like, we should always run to the Lord. The Lord is our refuge. He's our escape. That's where we go if we're in trouble. And even as a king... It says, you know, the king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation. How much more a king than, than even us? Like, we're going to go through a lot of problems as well, and we need to put our trust in him. It says, verse 3, For thou preventest him with the blessings of goodness, thou settest a crown of pure gold on his head. He asks life of thee, and thou givest it him, even length of days forever and ever. Like, the Lord decides how long you live. Like, if you're doing good work for God, he's going to keep you alive longer than if you're not profitable at all. So again, doing the works is a way, and setting our foundation on the Lord, he's going to lengthen our days. It says, His glory is great in thy salvation. Honor and majesty hast thou laid upon him, for thou hast made him the most blessed forever. Thou hast made him exceeding glad with thy countenance. For the king trusteth in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High he shall not be moved. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies, and thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. So again, with David and his enemies, he never went and attacked his enemies. He said, Lord, you need to deal with my enemies. You know, and he would pray many imprecatory prayers against his enemies. But that's the thing. He's got a whole army behind him. But does he go to the army and say, oh, we're just going to take care of business? Or does he go to the Lord and say, Lord, you need to take care of this? You know, it says, for the king trusteth in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. He's not trusting in himself. He's not trusting in men. He's trusting in the Lord. And if you believe that the Lord sees what your enemies are doing to you, and that he'll protect you, that he'll get revenge on them. It says, vengeance belongeth unto me. You know, then what do we have to fear? If you settle in your heart that the Lord fights for you, then, you know, the Lord has your back. You will not fear anything. You know, but you'll fear the Lord God himself. So I'll get you to turn to Acts chapter 4. And we're going to read a passage here where Peter, uh, they were being persecuted by the Jews because they were preaching in, outside the temple. And they pray an imprecatory prayer from Psalm chapter 2. We're going to read, start in verse 23 of Acts chapter 4. It says, And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. And when they, heard that they lifted, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, 
whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined afore to be done. And now, Lord, behold thy word. So now they're, gonna, they're coming back to God and saying, God, this is your word, behold thy word. Sorry, you lost me. So now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto the servants that deal with all boldness that they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. So Psalm 2, it's an imprecatory prayer that's being uh, quoted here. And this is something that David actually prayed against his enemies. You go back to Psalm 2, you'll see that that's what David was doing. Um, we also see Peter and the apostles, they're praying in that same manner. So this can be a good lesson for us. But what they prayed was, Lord, behold their threatenings. He wanted them to stop their mouths and give the boldness to the apostles to preach the word of God unhindered. You know, they're preaching the word of truth. Um, and it's a great prayer if you don't have the boldness to preach the gospel. This is a prayer you can also pray. That if you feel like you have enemies who are preventing you from preaching the gospel, just pray to the Lord, Lord, stop their mouths and let your will be done. Let your word be preached with boldness. You know, because he'll give you the fullness of the spirit to preach his word, because that's what God wants. The will of the Father is that all men will believe on his son. Amen. So, you know, if you want to do the will of God, then God's going to allow you to do that if you're walking in his will. But you see that they, uh, they prayed according to the scriptures because they knew the scriptures. You know, they'd meditated and said it on their heart, these things. And that's important for us too. So it's, if you want your prayers answered, the best way you can do that is to pray according to the scriptures. So find the promises of God and pray according to that. Say, God, you promised. Here's chapter and verse. This is what I'm asking for. You said you'd give it to anyone who asked you. I'm asking you for this. And hold God accountable for his word. You know, because God loves to be reminded of that, of his promises. It's not that we have to remind him he's God, but this is how we ask for those things. So I'll get you to turn to Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to read from uh, Ephesians 3.14. But it explains why it's critical that we are actually rooted and grounded in the Lord and in his truth. Because that's how you get that confidence and boldness. You know, you remain fearless in the face of adversity and persecution. So after, uh, after Colossians 2, we'll also be going to Ephesians chapter 4, but you'll be there in Colossians 2. I'll read from Ephesians 3.14. It says, For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. It's talking about being filled with the Spirit. Um, and it talks about strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. So being rooted and grounded in the love of Christ, that causes your feet to be planted on that solid rock of salvation and strength. And this does come from the inner man. That's the new man. That's the one who was born again of God. But that's where our strength is. You know, it's by the Spirit of God, but it's through faith. Colossians 2.5, where you should be. It says, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith. As ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands 
in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein you are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So you notice how Paul is warning them to be rooted and built up in Christ, established in the faith. You know, we should be rooted and grounded in love, in the love of Christ. But why does he, why does he say that? Because afterwards, as we saw, he continues on into men spoiling them with traditions. You know, men spoiling them with vain deceit. And even mentioning some of the doctrines like circumcision and baptism that were the things that were being spoiled with. Because um, people were coming back in and tr- t- trying to get people back under the law in that time. And we even see that today. People who teach you go to repent your sins or do works for salvation. You know, they're trying to spoil you with vain deceit. But if you've already settled in your heart what salvation is, you already know what salvation is, then you will not be spoiled by these men. So there's a warning from Paul that in order to not be spoiled, in order to not be moved, in order to, to have your feet firmly planted on the foundation of Christ, that you need to, you know, to avoid being led away by these men, you know, you've got to plant yourself in, in the Lord. You've got to trust in his word. You've got, to, you've got to believe what he says. And if you hold to that, if you actually truly believe that and settle that in your heart, then you won't be moved. These men will have no chance. So in Ephesians 4 verse 11, if you want to turn there quickly, it says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more, henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So again, if you're rooted and established, these men are not going to have any chance to be able to draw you away into these false, false doctrines. Because you're already going to know better. You know the word. You know that they're lying. You can call, either call them out on it or you can just disregard what they say because you're not going to be part of what they're doing. You're not going to be fooled by them and you can even warn other people against them. These are false teachers. Because you know what the word says. But you only know because you read. You only know because you studied yourself. And in James chapter 1, if you want to turn there, James 1.21, it says, uh, it's important not to be a hearer of the word, but a doer also. And we'll see this come up a bit. Uh, certainly the Lord in the New Testament was preaching on this pretty heavily. But in James 1.21, it says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word. Again, you've got to see they received the word. With the Bereans, they received the word. They heard it, but then they also went away and studied it. So again, you've got to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So if all you do is come to church once a week, and you just listen to the preaching, but you never read the word for yourself, you know, you never make application to what you're hearing, or reading, you know, then you're like that vain man just looking into a mirror, just regarding himself and not regarding the things of God. You know, and if you're without works, without the reading and continuing in the perfect law of liberty, then the Bible says that's vanity. If you desire to be blessed of God, you know, to be established and grounded, not fearful and not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, then you need to read his word, you need to meditate on his word, and you need to do the works that he's commanded us to do. And part of that is serving the people of God, you know, certainly in the local church. And we're fortunate to have a good church here where just about everybody contributes in some way, whether it be cleaning or preaching or soul winning or, you know, anything. There are people who, who, you know, do certain, a lot of works around here, you know, do preparing food and lunches and events and things like that. Like, we've got a great church here where there's a lot of people doing the works. Um, 
But the church was established by Christ. You know, he gave himself for it. And that's how much he loves the church. He died for the church. He gave his blood for the church. You know, it, it was us as individuals for salvation, but also he died for the church. He gave himself for it. Um, and we should share that same love for the church and for the brethren that Christ has. You know, as it said in Ephesians 3, we should be rooted and grounded in love. And that's why it's also important to be in church. You know, if we don't forsake the assembly because that's one way that we get established in the word is through teaching and preaching and fellowship. Iron sharpeneth iron. You know, this is how we become established in the faith. You know, and we, uh, we'll read from uh, Matthew 16, verse 17. It says, And Jesus said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee kingdom, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And we see this again when it comes to judgment in the church. Um, this same, same thing is given, that we have the authority. You know, Christ, after he departed this earth, after his resurrection, he gave the power of judgment to the church. You know, and all this has to be done in accordance with scripture. But how can you do that? How can you judge righteously if you don't know the scripture? Because even not just the church, not just the pastor, but we ourselves are told to judge. And again, we, must, we can't judge if we don't know the commandments, if we don't know the word of God, if you're not firmly planted on the foundation of Christ. You know, so they should be in your heart and established forever. You know, that's done through reading, through studying, through teaching and through preaching. In uh, 2 Timothy 2.14, it says, Of these things put them in remembrance charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. So again, that's another warning, those who try and subvert the hearers. You know, the next instruction is how we avoid that scenario which plays out in the church or even your family and personal life. 2 Timothy 2.15, again a very famous passage, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase under more ungodliness. So you've got to study to show yourself approved under God. You can't trust in what your wife knows. You can't trust in what your husband knows. Children can't trust in what their parents know. You've got to study to show yourself approved before God. You know, you need to work and labor in the word. Because if you do that, then you're not going to be led astray by every deception of men. And there are plenty out there. Like you've only got to look at not, not even just outside of, of Baptists, but within Baptists themselves, there's a lot of heresy going on. And you can easily be persuaded by every deception of men if you don't study to show yourself approved. So that brings me to the last point, which is how do we make an application of this? You know, God's word is our foundation. It's what he left us. It's the King James Bible. And everyone here I know we trust in this Bible. It is the word of God. I'll get you to turn to Psalm 119, verse 145. So Psalm 119, verse 145. It says, I cried with my whole heart. Hear me, O Lord, I will keep thy statutes. I cried unto thee, save me, and I shall keep thy testimonies. I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried. I hoped in thy word. Mine eyes prevented the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. Hear my voice according to thy loving kindness, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgment. They draw nigh that follow after mischief. They are far from thy laws. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. So the Lord established his word and his commandments and he founded it forever. And that's why we believe in the preservation, you know, and the perfection of the King James Bible. You know, because he said he will preserve it forever. We have confidence in the King James Bible, you know, and we should take all our beliefs from that clear reading of the word. 
You know, there are many false doctrines out there, but you never come to them on your own just by the Holy Ghost and sitting down with the King James. You're only going to learn those from men, from commentaries and from preaching. But that's not an excuse because that's why God says study to show yourself approved. There's no excuse for falling into heresy. You've got to study for yourself. And just don't believe every preacher out there because there are many false teachers, many false preachers. And it says that's why our faith must be placed in the word and what the word clearly says, not what the word doesn't say. So a lot of people take doctrines from things the Bible doesn't say or the Bible didn't, didn't say something here so maybe that's true or whatever. It's like just go on what it clearly says because otherwise you will be led astray by false doctrine. Because you can make up all kinds of strange and false doctrines from what the Bible doesn't say or from what it doesn't clearly say. You know, as we showed before, we need to compare the teaching of men with what the Bible actually says, as just as the Bereans did. You know, study to show thyself approved unto God, because you don't want to be ashamed of your own ignorance of his word. So I'll get you to turn to Revelation chapter 21. And while you do that, I'll read from Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6 1. So you're turning to Revelation 21. I'll read from Hebrews 6.1. It says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So that's salvation. Now, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permits. So at the very least, these are the first doctrines that you should be establishing and settling in your heart. You know, this is, this is the milk of the word. These are the principles of the doctrine of Christ. They're foundational doctrines. You know, so those doctrines are salvation by grace through faith. It's baptism after salvation as a step of obedience. You've got the laying out of hands, the resurrection from the dead, and the eternal judgment. So once you've established these doctrines, you don't need to lay them again. In 1 Corinthians 3.11 it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So in that it continues to go on, you know, adding on to the foundation good works for rewards, which we also saw in James chapter 1. You know, it says, If any man build upon this foundation, that foundation being Christ. So we should be building upon that foundation, but in order to do that you have to first have that foundation. And the Bible's consistent, and that's why we have full faith and assurance in it. So as we conclude today, uh, actually I will get you, hold your place in Revelation 21. I'll get you to turn to Matthew 7 and Luke chapter 6. Uh, Matthew 7, 24 and Luke 6, 46. Because I just want to go through this parable um, just as part of the conclusion. In Matthew 7, 24, Jesus says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So we'll see that again in Luke chapter 6 verse 46. He says, And why you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He's like a man who built a house, dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock, and when the flood arose, the, steam beat, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So again, you say, you know, he that heareth my sayings and doeth them. And it even says here, you know, he built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation. Again, that's studying to show yourself approved. You know, you've got to dig deep and actually labor in the word to establish those foundations. But once you do, you can build upon those foundations. Gold, silver, precious stones. You know, they're your rewards in heaven. 
So uh, the last place you'll need to turn is uh, Revelation 21. But you notice the connection there with being a hearer and a doer of the word and the works of God. So to establish yourself, to be rooted and grounded in the foundation of Christ, you must hear his word but also be a doer. So we come to church to hear the word, but if you just come and hear, it's, it's like you're looking in the mirror. You know, it's vanity. You've actually got to apply that to yourself. You've got to also study the word, whether these things are so, because once you study those things and say, yeah, Pastor Kevin was right about that. You know, or Brother Jason or Brother Callum was right about that. It's like, then you can establish that as truth in your heart. You won't need to go back and revisit that. That's already established. But it's only done through diligent study, through actually laboring in the word. So you've got to read a word, meditate on the word, and do good works unto your men, unto men and brethren. And I spend that time in the spirit every day reading the word and praying to the Lord because that's what he instructs us to do if we want to know him he's to be found in, in the Bible that's how you know God but you also can't do his commandments you can't do the works he set aside for you if you don't even know what they are and you can't rely on us you know any of the preachers to get up here and explain it to you you've got to actually study for yourself whether we're lying to you or whether we're telling the truth you know, now we've got great men up here, of course we tell the truth. But we only know that because we study for ourselves, you know. So in verse 1 of Revelation 21, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write for, these things, write for these words are true and faithful. And that can be said for all of God's word. All his words are true and faithful. Every single one in the King James Bible. In verse 6 it says, Then he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Well, I mean, this is part of not only Christ's inheritance but also our inheritance. This new heaven and new earth, this, this heavenly Jerusalem. We're just about to see what this is. But again, this is another one of the promises, the things we have to look forward to. It says in verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So the foundation of the city of God, that new Jerusalem, that's the twelve sons of Jacob, the twelve sons of Israel. And they're being represented by the twelve gates. And the 12 apostles as well being re represented by the 12 foundations. So our foundations should be on the law, on the prophets, and on the apostles, and the things that they taught. Yeah, so that's the 66 books that we have here in the King James Bible. That's the law, that's the prophets, that's the apostles. And that's where you know, everything in here points to Christ the rock. You know, we saw in Deuteronomy, you know, their rock is not like our rock. You know, our rock is something special. If you're founded on the rock of God, you know, you will not be moved. And the purpose of the sermon is just to show the importance of knowing God. The only way to know him and his doctrines 
you know, is to actually read the law, the prophets and the apostles. And, and we need to establish those things in our heart as well. When you read them, when you study them, then just settle those things in your heart. Because you, otherwise you might find that men are able to lead you away. You might be tossed to and fro, you know, because you only are in the milk of the word, you're actually not getting down into the meat of the word. And it doesn't mean you can't be corrected with scripture, but we should always be willing to hear a matter, but we should also be willing to study a matter and to conclude for ourselves, you know, whether we're in error according to the word of God. So what's important that you not only know what you believe, but you understand why you believe it and actually have scriptural basis and clear scripture on why you believe something. You know, we need a basis in the word of God to prove all things. So if you understand and have settled in your heart that salvation's a free gift, given by the grace of God through faith in his son, then no one's going to be able to convince you of another gospel. You know, if you understand and have said it in your heart that the scripture clearly teaches Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He is God, then you're not going to receive those who teach the heresy of oneness or any variation of the Trinitarian view. You know, God is the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. That's clear scripture. That's what we base our belief on. The same goes for the resurrection of Christ and the saints. You know, Pastor Kevin's been teaching the last few weeks on the resurrection the different resurrections and the different, uh, different judgments. You know, but Christ is the first fruits. And then we that are Christ that is coming. You know, there's an order to things. And understanding the different judgments, understanding the different, uh, different resurrections, who takes part in those things. You know, you go to the judgment seat of Christ, which is for believers, the great white throne judgment for those who are, who are condemned, you know. Um, these are doctrines, again, that should be settled in your heart because they're very clear in the scriptures. You know, some maybe that we believe are clear that others say are not clear, but the post-trib pre-wrath rapture, you know, which is taught in the scriptures. You're not going to come to a pre-trib position, you know, with just the scriptures and the Holy Ghost alone. It's a doctrine of men and it relies on other wicked doctrines of men, you know, such as Zionism and dispensationalism. But we believe, as the Bible rightly teaches in replacement theology, the old covenant was replaced with the better covenant. That's what the Bible says clearly. So when you understand and settle the foundations of our faith, you'll find that the rest of Scripture is very easy to understand. Everything just falls into place. But if you've got heresy here or heresy there, you're actually going to have trouble trying to match everything up. It's not until you have these foundations settled in your heart that you actually can start building your doctrines upon them. You know, and I, if you try and understand through the lens of man's wisdom, whether that be through commentary, Schofield, or dispensational, the, you know, as they say, the lens of dispensationalism, like, you're going to fail and find yourself in great error. And another thing, husbands are responsible for your families. So you may establish your own foundations, but you've also got to make sure your wife, you know, while they're responsible to study to show themselves approved under God, you still, as the head of the house and the spiritual head, should be teaching them the foundations that you have settled in your heart and help them to also settle those in their heart. Um, so if you're not sure about what foundational doctrines are, um, we have the Statement of Faith on the website. Um, Pastor Kevin's also preached through, I believe, all of them on the YouTube channel. Um, we've also got the Being Baptist DVD, which covers what's foundational for a Baptist, which we're an independent Baptist church. Um, but these are, core doc these are all the core doctrines that you should settle in your heart. Um, but you, what you need to do is study for yourself and settle them in yourself for these things. You know, read the scriptures daily and put into practice the things that you read and hear. Because that way when the rain comes, when the wind blows, when the storms of persecution, you know, the false doctrines and tribulation, they rage on around you. When that stream beats, beats upon your house, you shall not be moved, for your house is built upon a rock. So let's pray.